commonly used description for the normal faulting that accommodates crustal extension is the domino model. In this model, the upper crust is assumed to stretch by an array of parallel planar normal faults that slip and rotate as stretching is accumulated across this area. So let's try and set this up using some simple experiments. And we're going to use uh, some cans, we're going to use some paperback books, and maybe some CDs. So this is how we're going to set it up. We're going to use uh, some cans to act as the rigid margins of the unstretched basin to keep everything together. And we'll put either our CDs or the paperback books as fault blocks. Let's have a look at the paperback book um, scenario. In this, we need to make sure that the paperback books are all from the same series, so they have the same, at least the same uh, page size. Let's think about how this is going to work. So the edges between the books will act as the fault surfaces, and the spines of the books will act as the top of the pre-riff succession. So this is the situation after pulling the blocks apart, and we can see that books which started up upright are being tipped over sideways, exposing their front covers, which are the exposed fault surfaces. The floor of our basin, therefore, consists in part of the original spines of the books, the blue areas, and in part the fault surface. Here we are, and we can look at this side on now. We can see that our books have rotated over. We can see that we've got a series of fault surfaces in here which have slipped, and the spines of the book which have been dropped down and rotated. And we could if we wanted to add together all the heaves that we see across here, the horizontal displacements uh, of the faults. Notice that the fault surfaces here are curved, and that's reflecting a slight distortion in the books. We haven't managed to keep them perfectly rigid, and there's a bit of dilatancy. The pages have popped apart a bit, and as a consequence, the faults have become curved. So that's books. Books not perfectly rigid, but CD cases or DVD cases, they're much better. So let's have a look at setting these up. Here we go. And what we're going to do now is quantify the relationships between the amount of extension and the rotation of the CDs, our proxies of fault blocks. Here we go. Rotate a bit. Move the blocks a bit further apart, and a bit more, and a bit more. So there we have the rotation of the faults, of the rotation of the CDs, that have accommodated the extension as we've increased the separation between our cans of tomatoes. So we can quantify this. We're going to measure the distance from crest to crest across our model and we're going to measure the dips of the faults as we go. Okay, so we're measuring the distance from edge to edge from our two bounding CDs we've got on here, and we're going to measure the rotations of the fault, in other words, the sides of our CD boxes in here. They start off vertical, and they're going to rotate, and that angle is going to open the more stretching we impose. Okay, so we can plot this as we go. We've got a little protractor on there that we can use to measure this. Okay, so in this particular case, the angle of the faults are yet to move, they're dipping at 90 degrees, and that's the distance there across the array of our CDs. Okay, so off we go. So no stretch, so here we are, our blob one. Let's have a little bit of motion, and now we can see that the angle is opening up here. We've opened the dip of the faults is 79 degrees now, and we've got uh, increase the distance between the tops of our CDs. Let's keep going. A bit more. A bit more. Here is our plot. And we can fit a curve to those points through there, which shows how the dips of faults change as the change in length of our model increases. 
we can make and make our length scale dimensionless by thinking about the, the change in length. The initial width was 103 millimeters, um, so um, 51 and a half is the half of the original length. So that would be a stretching factor of an e of 0.5. So now elongation is dimensionless between here, and we can actually relate that graph to the amount of elongation. Let's take our results and plot them on the graph of Wernicke and Birchfield. We've contoured it up for beta. Beta is 1 plus e. Our graph shows e. So we just, we, our stretch factor finished it when the value of stretching was 0.4 e, which is a beta of 1.4. So let's plot our numbers up on the graph. The faults initiate at 90 degrees when the top of our CDs was zero, and they run down the axis like this. And you can see that we finished our experiment when the stretching factor was 1.4. So this model demonstrates the viability of the Wernicke and Birchfield model quite nicely. With increasing stretch, we increase elongation, and we consequently rotate our fault blocks in the manner that we've just seen. So these are really neat experiments for showing how fault blocks rotate as stretching increases. We can use the CDs to provide a strictly rigid fault block model. We can use the paperback books to explore non-rigid behaviours.